All right, looks like we made it to the five minute mark. So if you wanna uh, swap things over, I can begin with introductions, I guess. Um, so yeah, hello everybody. Um, welcome to, um, to this Riot's meeting. Uh, I, I'm gonna, first of all, just kind of briefly touch on a couple notes about, you know, what the theme is today, what the topic is, and then I'll be introducing our speakers. Uh, just to also let you know, the plan for the day is basically to have all three speakers um, present, you know, what, what they want to talk about today, and then we're actually going to be mostly holding off on addressing questions and kind of the more discussion part uh, until the end. So you can feel free to use the FAQ. I will try to jump on kind of easier, simpler questions, maybe that don't have to go to the speakers, but then I'll also kind of keep a bank of, of um, more discussion-y questions that, that uh, I can then present to the speakers later. So I'll kind of be moderating uh, today. Um, so obviously, I think most people here are not going to, you know, find it controversial if I say that uh, replication has become something of increasing interest to psychologists. Um, and, you know, it's been brought up from time, um, from time to time that in various crisis related papers that maybe students might play some kind of critical role um, in addressing the, the low rates of replication studies that uh, people often point out occur, at least direct replication studies uh, in our field. Um, on the one hand, this might be a very helpful thing just in increasing the raw number of replication studies that might be taking place, but also it might be an exciting opportunity for undergraduates to learn about the challenges of research design or what exactly people were actually meant when they uh, wrote things in their original manuscripts. So um, I myself have supervised a few dissertations back in Canada that uh, were basically replication studies, and it's given me a little bit of a chance to get a sense of what that's all about. But I also know it's not always the default at different universities. And um, our speakers today are various people who can share insights that might be able to help us uh, guide these future efforts, hopefully towards, uh, towards more of this. So we'll begin by hearing from Dr. Jim Grange. He is a reader in psychology at Keele University. Um, prior to coming to Kiel, he completed his um, bachelor's, master's, PhD at Bangor University in North Wales. Uh, Dr. Grange is an experimental cognitive psychologist, and he's interested in cognitive control processes, so mechanisms that enable the human mind to control itself. Um, Justin Ailes is a lecturer in the Department of Psychology and Neurosciences at St. Andrews. Uh, his research encompasses three topics neuroimaging, vision, and computation. And using EEG and fMRI, he's interested in studying computational mechanisms that visual cortex utilizes for information processing uh, related to optimally responding to variations in the environment caused by changes in stimulus properties and changes in behavioral goals. Um, and uh, we finally have Dr. Catherine Button, who is a senior lecturer in the Department of Psychology at Bath. Um, using experimental techniques from cognitive psychology and neuroscience, her work focuses on the cognitive mechanisms that contribute to common mental health disorders, anxiety, depression, and how these mechanisms might be modified to reduce anxiety and improve mood. And she also works with clinical data from randomized control trials to investigate factors uh, related to responses to CBT. Um, so we are going to begin today by hearing from uh, from Jim Grange. Uh, so I will turn things over to him. Um, and okay, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so just bear with me also share the screen. Okay. Um, can you see and, and hear this? <laughs> That's always a good check. Excellent. Great. Well, thank you ever so much for the, for the introduction. Thanks also for the opportunity to speak uh, today. I think it's such an important uh, topic. And as you mentioned, we're, we're, we're training the next generation of researchers. So it's important that we really engage our students with some of these uh, issues. So I'm just going to talk really about some of my uh, experiences with supervising uh, replication studies. These are pretty uh, low-scale replications, um, so I, I know Kay's going to be talking about something much, much grander a little bit later. So I think really we'll be able to give you the, uh, the whole gamut of different ways you can engage students with, with replication. Um, 
Well, I've got a, a long-standing interest in replication attempts, which goes back to my undergraduate uh, final year project. So during my BSE dissertation, it was only one experiment. Uh, it was a replication attempt and it was a failed replication attempt. So this was back in the day when you, you, you fail to replicate something and you think you've done something wrong rather than maybe uh, the literature is, is, is uh, wrong. So um, I experienced this quite early on. So I, I know how a student feels when they engage in a replication and, and how it feels when a replication doesn't quite work out. Um, but then I went on to do my MSc and now did two experiments. The first again was a, a, a failed replication, this time of a study from a PhD student in the same group. So that was a, a little bit awkward. Um, and then experiment two, I tried to generalize uh, their, their, their finding to, uh, to a different scenario and just produce completely null results. Um, I then continued this trend into my PhD. I did eventually discover some things, um, but my first paper from my PhD was also uh, reporting three failed uh, replications. So these were closed replication attempts of studies in my field, and I, I didn't uh, reproduce uh, their findings. So I know how a student feels when they engage uh, in replications. Just to give you a bit of context about my supervision uh, experience and also the, just the context of, in which I supervise, because I think that really does shape how I approach um, my supervision today. I have about 12 to 14 students per year, so it's a pretty heavy supervision load. Um, I find on the whole that my students are they're, they're super keen, they're super able students, so they are able to really elevate and uh, uh, really do some quite strong uh, research with you. Um, they have huge ambitions for their projects. So what I find a lot of my time in the early days is really trying to just bring down their ambitions a little bit to make it something that's actually deliverable within the time that they're going to be working with me. They tend not to be too keen on working with, with other students. They want ownership over, over their projects and you know they, they don't want their marks to be dependent on other students. And I, I don't know what it's like elsewhere, but most of my students seem to want to be clinical psychologists. So as I'll discuss a little bit later, this is a bit of an issue for someone who views themselves as a, as a pure cognitive uh, researcher. So what I'm going to talk very briefly with you today is just some suggestions based on how I approach uh, supervision and how I embed replication into, uh, into my students' work. Um, the first one isn't about supervision at all, really. It's about the importance of uh, it, embedding the importance of, of replication throughout the whole curriculum. So I'll talk briefly about that. Um, I'll differentiate between direct replications and conceptual replications and provide just a couple of tips about how I approach uh, if you're just having a student just doing a one-off replication attempt. What I've been doing more recently though is encouraging students to add additional facets to a replication design so the students are able to have ownership over some novel aspect of their final year project, but there's a, there's a replication study embedded uh, within it. And also uh, really primarily due to my supervision load, group projects, they're the future, um, how I bake replication into uh, group projects that I have students working on nowadays. So first of all, the importance of replication throughout the curriculum, I probably don't need to, to convince people of this, but I never miss an opportunity to, to just stress that how important this is. And really, I think it's so important uh, for a final year project supervisor because the challenge is that you want your students to arrive with you who need no convincing that replications aren't boring or lacking in novelty or scientific interest. You really want them to arrive already keen on the idea that, that a replication study is a worthwhile final year project. So this is what you want. You want them to have little or no convincing. And in order for that to happen, they need to have been exposed to the importance of replications throughout their whole undergraduate degree. I know the talks today are about the final year project specifically, um, but I think I've, I've found this just such an important uh, ingredient. So we need to embed open research reproducibility themes all the way throughout the, the degree program. And um, when I was head of school here at, at Kiel, uh, we worked on introducing this throughout the whole curriculum. So we introduced replication reproducibility in uh, year one. So in the first semester, the students are with us, we're talking about uh, reproducibility. Uh, we have pre-registrations used in year one research methods modules. Um, in year two, I dedicate a whole lecture to the replication crisis and the so-called year of horrors and all of the fallout from that. We focus our year two research methods around proposed solutions to this replication crisis, talking about power, effect sizes, Bayesian analysis, meta-analysis, uh, et cetera. 
And of course, we exclusively use uh, open source software. So we win most of the battle by having students arriving in the final year who know about this stuff, who realize that replications are a valid and important ingredient to science and they're A-OK -okay with engaging with it in their final year project. So um, if I'm wanting just a student to just conduct uh, an individual discrete piece of work on their own, maybe a student just wants to work on their own, uh, I have students conduct either a direct replication or a conceptual replication of something that we're working on uh, in the group. So just a, a definition, direct replication is a replication that's as faithful as possible. So you're trying to make everything as exact as possible to uh, an original uh, study. So you're trying not to deviate too much. Whereas a conceptual replication, this is where you're trying to test the boundary conditions of a, of a previously reported effect. It's useful to test uh, confounds that may have been uh, present in the original study, or maybe you just want to test the generalizability of the finding. So I find that students are quite happy to and, and keen to engage in direct replications and also conceptual replications, but they do have their unique uh, challenges. One useful thing that I use though is, uh, this is a little bit of a shameful plug, um, we, we published a replication recipe a few years ago. Um, so this is a paper just like a, a recipe for baking a cake. Uh, if you follow these instructions in this paper, the idea is that you should end up with a pretty convincing replication attempt. So students can use this paper to really guide their project and how they're developing their thinking around the project, basing it around this replication recipe, and they end up with a, a, a pretty good uh, and convincing replication at the end of it. I found some challenges with having students engage in direct or conceptual replications. Um, so these are things that you might encounter if you're wanting to dip your toes into this. Um, it's, it, it's difficult for students to identify on their own what is worth replicating. Not everything needs replicating. The Stroop effect has been replicated so many times it would be not worth doing it again. Um, also, close replications or direct replications are, are, are pretty much always nearly impossible for, for FYPs, um, primarily due to power demands, but, but Kay's got a great solution to that, that 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 she'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but sometimes you just don't have access to a particular population or the materials that uh, an original author has used. Um, another problematic issue is that some students, uh, but less so given the education, but, but sometimes supervisors view conducting a direct replication as a little bit of a cop out. And the students who have just, they, they view it as just copying what, what somebody else has been done requires much less intellectual input, and they view these projects as less uh, valuable than, than others. I, I completely don't agree with that, but I think there is a bit of work to be done in taking people on a journey about educating our colleagues about how important uh, replications can be. So to some tips about engaging in some of these replications, help your students identify and justify the replication target. This is typically the, the, the biggest barrier. What is worth replicating? Help them with that. Um, it's best if it's something that your research program would value, something that you're working on in your, in your research group. Um, Utilize the replication recipe. It's, it's relatively uh, uh, linear and, and foolproof. Um, so it's a, I think it's a great resource to help students work through a replication attempt. We, in that, we talk about the importance of pre-registration, and this is great for students because it helps. They basically get their introduction and method written in the first semester if they've engaged in a, in a, in a full pre-registration. But also, if you're doing a uh, highly valued replication, publish the work with your students. Um, so I've, I've published several direct replications with my uh, students. Um, and of course, it's great for their career, it's great for science, but it's also great to convince next year's students that uh, engaging in direct replications are, are, are really valued and, and it can really help with their, uh, with their career profile. Something which I've been doing more and more recently, though, is to add an additional facet to a replication design. And this, this will be a little bit more straightforward to engage with. So if you recall that I said that most of my students want to be clinical psychologists, but I'm uh, primarily a pure cognitive psychologist. So what I've done over the past couple of years is to have my students replicate a cognitive effect, but then to add on a clinical aspect to the study. So that way, everybody wins. The student gets to conduct something clinical. It's also something potentially novel. So they feel that they've got, they're adding something to uh, a replication. And I also then get to examine the robustness of the cognitive effects, because although there's a, a clinical aspect to it, I get to see, does the cognitive element of it uh, actually replicate? And um, 
a great example of this, uh, a student of mine uh, who's graduating today, actually, the graduation ceremony is going on uh, right now. We're currently writing up a paper about depression and perceptual load. Um, so I'm not going to go into the details of this, but there's the cognitive effect that, that tests uh, selective visual attention. Um, I don't have the time to go through this, but I'll skip over this. Um, but what we're able to do is we're able to replicate uh, this effect. So she was interested in this perceptual load effect, but she was also interested in, in uh, depression symptomatology. So I was interested, first of all, does this effect replicate uh, using an online sample? So I hadn't seen it being replicated using online studies. So what we're able to do is conduct the study I get the behavioral data, so I get to see, does this perceptual load effect replicate uh, with an online sample? Overall response times are a little bit elevated. The critical effect is an interaction between these two, and, we, and we've, we find that very well in the online sample. However, what my student got from it is that she was then able to see whether this, the magnitude of this perceptual load effect relates to mag, uh, severity of depression symptomatology. We found a, uh, a small but a highly significant negative a relationship between these two that we're now following up uh, in ongoing work. So this is a way that if you have students who feel that, well, I'm, you know, I'm not really able to do much novelty if I'm just doing a direct replication, there's ways to add things to it to make it novel for the student, but you get to view uh, replication rates in a particular field. I've enjoyed this type of work so much, I've actually pivoted my research mission to incorporate this type of work. So on my website now, I, I say that my mission of my lab's work is to conduct fundamental research to understand cognitive control. That's how it was before. And now due to this work that I've been doing with my students, I then use this knowledge to tackle clinical and applied questions. So I think this is just a really nice way if you, if you uh, engage your students in an authentic way with replication and the work that you're doing, it can actually influence your own research as well. And I found that of, of great value. So the final one, and this is really where I'm finding the most bang for my buck in terms of students' value, but also my value as, as, as a researcher, is, is having our students work in group projects. The motivation, I said, is that we've got a large uh, supervision load, and I personally find that quite hard to manage. Typically, I had 14 independent studies going on, and my Adley mind wasn't able to keep up with all of them. Um, I also wanted the students to have a real research lab experience where they're, they're, they're sharing their research with others who are working on a similar question, provides your students with an instant study support group. Um, but importantly, related to this talk, you get to combine studies to produce a meaningful contribution where replication is basically baked into the design of your group projects. So imagine these are all my, in, in, in my 12 students have all got independent uh, ideas about what they want to do. What I try and do is I base them into groups of four and have each of them address a particular research question. This can either be something that I'm interested in or something that students generate themselves. It has to relate to the mission of my group's work. Um, but what I'm able to do within this, because students are working on a similar problem, I'm able to bake replication into it. So for example, a project I'm uh, working on this year, relation between depression symptomatology and task switching performance, uh, one student is using the Beck's depression inventory and using a queued task switching design. Another student is using the same questionnaire, but is looking at a voluntary task switching paradigm. So I get to see how well the, the effects replicate across uh, just a, a conceptual replication of task switching. I've got another student looking at rumination tendencies and voluntary switching. So here I get to see whether the behavioral effects replicate, but just looking at different clinical questionnaires uh, and so on. So you see you've got replication sort of built within there because they're all conducting a task switching design. Maybe your lab, your lab has just detected a new effect and you want to test the boundary conditions of it. You could have one student conduct a direct replication and then your other three students conduct conceptual replications. As a whole, they're um, working on independent projects, but what you're getting from it is testing the robustness of a particular effect. Maybe you're interested in how your new effect that you've just discovered differs across different clinical profiles. You could have one student look at depression, another anxiety, schizotypy, ADHD, et cetera. All of them will be replicating your original uh, effect. So you get to test the robustness across all of those, but each student will get something of value from all of it because each will have a different uh, particular clinical uh, interest. Um, so that's what I've found quite useful over the past few years. And I've been getting some success in terms of student satisfaction, uh, but also driving my own uh, research as well. Um, so a bit of a win-win situation. 
and that's me. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much for that. Um, and just a reminder to uh, to attendees, if you do want to post questions, remember you can do that. That's fine. It's just we won't actually address them until a bit later. But if they're short ones, I can I can head them off now, and and if not, we'll bank them for later. Um, but okay, yeah, thank you, Brent. That was that was really awesome. I have a, a ton of questions to follow up on later, uh, and uh, uh, I guess we'll turn it over now to Justin. Um, so thank you. You can take the floor. If I'm unmute buttons and all these Zoom buttons to get. <laughs> Thanks. That was a really good introduction uh, uh, of all the, the ideas with the replications. I feel like I'm going to um, cover a lot of the same ground. I'm going to try to give it a, a slightly different perspective. Now, I'm not going to use slides. So I'm just going to try and, and I was just going to sort of talk about my experiences and differences uh, with what I've seen. Because I think we've, we've got people from various aspects across the the uk so i, I think one of the, the useful things here will be to talk about our, our different experiences so a little bit about me so i came to the uk in 2013 from the us so i came here to the university of st andrews up in scotland uh as a bit of a, a culture shock and, and, and differences going on and i and my background is is more on the the neuroscience and perception science. I didn't do psychology as an undergrad. I'm not, not connected to psychology. And the department we have here is actually psychology and neuroscience. So it's also a bit of a, a learning curve figuring out. It's like, wait, everybody has to do a project? That, I didn't, <laughs> that didn't have to do with mine. So, uh, um, and they get the students coming in and like she was saying, every single one of them wants to be a clinical psychologist. Um, and our department, doesn't do clinical psychology at all. I think we have two clinical psychologists on the faculty. So we have a hundred students who all wanna work with them and then they get thrown to me. And uh, you saw here the, the little bit of the intro. My interests are in vision, in perception and information processing and computational modeling, which you know the students come in and they're like, ah, oh, scared and they don't basically wanna have nothing to do with with my topics. So as part of this, me getting used to things is to try and figure out how I was going to um, engage with these students and, and come up with, with a, uh, ways to structure the, the supervision. Right. Popped up. Um, and uh, so that was about, so it was 2013. So it was about the same time the replication crisis was happening and coming up. And so, aha, that sort of, hit on me and just like Jim was talking about as a way to sort of marry these things of something I'm interested in and something that the, the student's interested in. Now I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit different. So Jim's got what, 12 to 14 students. I supervise three to six depending, depending, depending on how they go. Um, and you've got in England a three years to get them through. We've got here four years Kind of, because we've got a four-year degree, but the first two years don't count to the final degree classification. So we have to fit the BPS requirements in the final two years, because only modules that are included in the final degree classification kind of count. So we got this sort of funny set of things to, to try, try and get through. Now, in my teaching for the lower years, I do the same thing Jim does. I have a... Um, I do a lecture on the replication crisis and try and talk about replication. But one of the things I found when, when they get to me and I talk to them, different, so, so Jim is saying he is having a, a, people thinking the replications is not real science. For me, the students I talk to, I get the opposite. I sort of, when I give them sort of a replication to set through, I get more of um, a relief, I think. They think like here, oh, wait, I don't have to come up with a big research question. I can sort of work with something and I have a, a framework and a structure and something to start with. I, I don't have a blank slate. So almost all the students who I, I um, work with with the replications have been actually really happy to do the replication. And I'll talk a little bit how it's structured later. Because um, one of the things I wanted to mention um, for this and, I, and to talk to, to others here about is, um, the level of anxiety 
in students because I found that especially with these research projects, the students have a lot of anxiety getting through. And I know there was one study, and I can put a link to it later in the chat, down in Australia was looking at students around the time they were submitting their dissertation projects and found, well, I don't misquote the, the number, um, about half of the sample scored in the clinical range of depression at the time of their thesis submission, which I, you know, looking back and thinking about it and seeing this, you can sort of, you know, the students, you see there's, there's a, a lot of, um, difficulties in, in putting these theses through. And so I think w one of the things to think about is things that we can use to sort of smooth out this project that, that people do. And, um, and one of the things I think is that students coming at the project, we've given them lots and lots of curriculum on research design and methods and experiments, but you know, it's still really kind of a really big black box to coming into a project. They really don't know what they're going to do. And that, I think, uncertainty really, well, it depends on the system. But for many students, that uncertainty of like a year long of what they're going to be doing um, can get into to a, a sort of loop that, that makes it difficult. And then I found that students then who get anxious and then don't engage then get more difficult to engage. So, and, and then you've got to rush at the end of the second semester to try and put something <laughs> together. And it's all a, a whole lot more work. Um, so uh, what have I done? So what I wanted to talk about next is the way I have approached my, my typical structuring. So what I do, because I have found my specific vision topics. If the student's really interested in, we, we go for it. But a lot of times they, they want to be more on the, the cognitive, cognitive level, clinical level. So, so what I do is we sit down and we discuss what we're going to do. And the way I say it is, this is the way we're going to structure it. We're going to, to find a study that you find interesting that's also feasible to replicate. So we're going to talk about the studies. We're going to look at it. And we're going to find one, and we're not going to find. We're not going to have to replicate a whole paper. We're going to pick one one study in in the paper, and you're going to do a direct replication of one aspect of that study, and then you're going to do an increment on that. Now, Jim was talking about the direct conceptual, so I wanted to to step back a bit just to make sure I'm not I'm not sure who's in the audience and how how up on this replication lingo they are. Because so, so I wanted to just to clarify that the, the difference, at least what I see. And I know there's always a bit of arguments here between direct and conceptual replication. Um, so I see it's a direct replication or a close replication or an exact replication. People use different words. Is a replication in which you have no reason to, be, to believe that things would be different. Because of course, you're gonna be replicating the study and there's gonna be differences, right? You're not gonna use the same participants. You're not gonna be using the same lab. You're not gonna be using the same computers. It's not gonna be the same phase of the moon. <laughs> there's, there's, there's a whole host of things. But the idea with the direct replication there is to, to keep everything as close as possible and not change things that you think may change the effect. And then the other end of this, the spectrum, there's something uh, they call the conceptual replication. Where well, you're not replication the specific operationalization of the hypothesis test, but you're thinking about the hypothesis test and you're replicating the idea. Um, and, and these are kind of like a continuum on the, um, on this uh, uh, from, a, direct to a conceptual, right? They, these, these aren't, I, I don't dichotomize these as, as it's one or, or the other. There's a series of um, small changes where you can be anywhere between the direct and, and the conceptual. And so what I say is we want one thing 
to be as close to a, a direct replication as possible. And then we want to do something in addition. So one of the things I was, was um, influenced by is in the US is um, something called the Collaborative Replications in Education Projects, um, which is a, a, a big project that we could talk about later. And the way they conceptualize things is direct, and they call something direct plus. And so direct plus a little increment. And in talking to students, depends, because we get a, a wide range of abilities and wide range of engagements in the project. Right? So, there is, so one of the things that I found very useful is that we can sit down and say, what can direct plus be? It can be all the way at the end of a, a conceptual, like a whole change of materials. And for the students who are really engaged, that's great. But a lot of students are, are like deers in the, the headlights. And what do I do? Well, we, I sit down and I, I say, well, look, there are a lot of interesting things we can do that may or may not be in, in the uh, original study. And so I usually have my list of things that, that I think to do. How about a, um, you can, we, we can look through the check, what do you think a moderating variable could be? We could, so we can measure at a, a moderating variable. How about a manipulation check? You know, a lot of these papers we read assume the, the experimental manipulation causes an effect and don't necessarily have a manipulation check. So putting a manipulation check in is, is useful. And when, when, when you engage with the students and talk to them about this way, they, they start to realize that it's not necessarily a big scientific research grant, big scientific question that they need to come up with, but more of, uh, uh, of engaging with probing the scientific literature. And I think that's uh, a, an important aspect for getting the direct replication and, and showing the students that they, they have something they can add. <laughs> they, they don't need to be a, a full on research faculty and have a full engagement. They, they can engage with the literature and think about it and think of something that, that might be useful to, to test. Um, and this is where, and, and that useful to test, I think is an important thing. And it's, it, it touches also back to exactly what Jim was saying about getting to, to publishable results. And to me, this goes to one of the things I've noticed in, in, in talking to people uh, across the field and the different things about what do we think a research project is? And that's, I think, one of these things we should engage with. Because the different people I've talked to have different ideas, vastly different ideas. From the one hand, I, I, I talk to people who think the reason for the research project is purely pedagogical. This is purely a module for them to, to demonstrate their individual mastery of the BPS requirements so we can graduate the, the students. On the other end of the spectrum is uh, people thinking, no, these are people who I want to bring, who become valuable members of my research lab and engage with my research lab and uh, develop part of a project. And to me, the, one of the interesting things that happens there in my, is in my department, we are psychology and neuroscience. So we have two degree programs, a psychology program and a neuroscience program. The neuroscience program isn't BPS recognized. So it doesn't have to follow any of the BPS project things. We still do a project. But the students who go through that program tend to go into wet neuroscience labs who are heavily constrained in what they can do. They can't come in and do anything they want because to work in those labs, a lot of the work there is licensed by the home office. So you are doing something within and uh, within a specific research program. And so then they come in and get integrated into a team that's uh, maybe got a postdoc or a PhD student and they're, they're working on part of a larger project. So they'll be doing say a dissection or one, a control experiment, a very small, small part. But when you get to the projects, they write ups, they're still incredibly good. So 
the even though the, the, maybe the research project isn't nearly as big as some or has as many moving parts, there's still a whole bunch of literature to engage with. And so I think moving the idea of these research projects from being a purely pedagogical exercise that gets ring fenced and into a real part of engaging with active science labs and, and developing the field and moving the literature for, further and moving the field further is really important and something we should be, be really trying to push. Uh, thank you, that's, that's what I've got for. All right, yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, that was really fascinating. And once again, I've got lots of questions for after. So if, if, if uh, nothing else, um, I'll be bothering you you both and, and I'm sure Catherine soon. Um, Catherine, is it better if I call you Kate? I'm sorry. Um, it's been a while since we earlier were talking about this. I seem to remember that maybe you prefer Kate. Is that right? Oh, you're muted. Sorry, it moved. I couldn't find the unmute button because it moved above my slides. <laughs> so I was like, where is it going? Um, I don't, I answered it either. Kate's fine. Okay. Perfect. Um, so yeah, next up we'll have Kate and she'll be taking a somewhat different approach um, to the, you know, involving students in replication with a more of a focus on this sort of consortium, um, larger data kind of approach to things. So I'm really looking forward to hearing about this too. Uh, take it can away. Can I just check you can see my slides okay? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Um, so thank you to the other speakers so far. They've actually covered, a, although I've got a slightly different approach in the kind of scope of the collaboration, the team science part, actually many of the themes about that kind of, I call it an extension and um, um, a replication and extension model, but um, both uh, Jim and Justin have talked about that as well. And that seems to be a kind of very effective model for, for student projects actually, is thinking about some sort of replication and then what can they add and extend it slightly to add their own thing in. Um, so I just start with, Moving um, so I've done quite a bit in the kind of systematic review world and um, one of the people I really like is Sir Ian Chalmers and he kind of once said that the results of a particular research study cannot be interpreted with any confidence unless they have been synthesized systematically with the results of all other relevant studies. And then the part I really like is that science is meant to be cumulative uh, but researchers usually don't accumulate scientifically. Um, and although he's talking about the justification for why you should do systematic review systematically, so, you know, taking that approach to kind of synthesizing evidence, I think it makes the broader point that no study is an island and that we all know that replication is important to start building that cumulative evidence base um, so, that, so that we can start to see a body of evidence that might be supporting a particular viewpoint or a particular clinical outcome or, or something. Um, I think that's probably more accepted in the more applied clinical world that I operate in because you would you wouldn't want to be giving drugs to patients based on a single small study you would want to see that actually there's a body of evidence that suggests that this treatment is effective and so on and um, so I think we all understand that replication can be really the bedrock of being able to achieve this kind of cumulative science and then there's the wider reproducibility problem that was really um, kind of informing my thinking when I started thinking about this approach. Um, you'll all know it, so I'll go through it quite quickly, but we have the you know, publication bias for positive novelty, uh, a culture where we have this publish or perish, might drive the desperate researcher to kind of adopt certain questionable research practices that make it more likely that they will get those positive results that are a bit novel and unexpected, um, but also, as we now know, are probably less reliable. Uh, so the common culprits that have been identified are low statistical power, which is something I'm particularly interested in, uh, poor control for bias, questionable research practices, and a focus on novelty rather than replication has historically been the problem. Um, and in 2016, you've probably already seen this, there was a survey done in Nature where they asked uh, whether kind of researchers felt that this was a genuine problem, and they did, and they suggested that the top reasons why we might be having this kind of problem was selective reporting, pressure to publish, poor experimental design, you know, low statistical powers there, but also this not problems with replication efforts and insufficient teaching and mentoring. So in 2015, I started lecturing at the University of Bath and I all of a sudden had a lot of final year dissertation students that I had to supervise. And I'd been thinking about the wider replication issues for some time, but it kind of really made me 
think about that in the microcosm that is our, the way that we teach our undergraduates, particularly in psychology. Um, and so it's really kind of struck me as being the problem magnified because we have multiple projects, you know, we might have a hundred of our undergraduate final year students are doing their final year dissertation as a three year project. They have very limited time, money and access to participants sometimes. Um, we had this assessment criteria that was really focused on individual contributions, creativity, novelty, which all creates this kind of potential for small underpowered studies that are poorly designed, testing novel hypotheses rather than replication and the potential for undisclosed flexibility. So I'm just gonna do a thought experiment with you because this is why I'm so, <laughs> interested in statistical power and, and, and how that influences my thinking around this. Um, but let's suppose we have 90% of student projects in our final year, um, the null hypothesis is true. So we've really encouraged them to really think outside the box and be incredible no incredibly novel in generating their research questions. And that novelty probably means that they're quite unlikely to be true as well. So we'll set this extreme example of 90% of cases where the null hypothesis is true. We'll set the significance level to the kind of classic 5%, but as we well know, the average power is probably going to be very low because they don't really have enough time to collect lots of data. Um, so let's say it's around 20%, which given some estimates from the literature isn't an unreasonable assumption. So let's suppose there are 100 undergraduate studies that we run. We now have 10 true associations that are going to exist. We have 20% power to detect two of those. Yeah, so out of the 10 that could be true, we're going to be able to detect two of them. Of the remaining 90 non-associations, we're going to falsely declare between four and five of them, that's 5% of them, as statistically significant. Cool. Now suppose significant findings get submitted for publication. So I'm very excited as a supervisor. I've got, you know, my novel hypothesis has found a significant result, very good for publication as we know. Uh, so, but unfortunately two out of three of those will be false positives. So kind of got me asking the question of, are we embedding a culture that rewards chance results over robust methods at the kind of earliest stage of our methodological training? And what do other researchers say? You know, what are the kind of factors that could improve reproducibility well you know from this survey in nature training is the key thing that came out better teaching better understanding of statistics better you know there's a real there was a real feel in 2016 that we definitely need better training and that this needs to start at the undergraduate level and that we need incentives for formal reproduction so I think they're talking about replication here but you know we need to start building it into the culture as both Jim and Justin have said you know that repl replication is a core part of how we should be doing science it should be a core part of our culture. Um, we've also made some other specific recommendations and lots of others have too. Um, you know, I'm very keen on thinking about sample size justification being a key part when designing studies, pre-registration, open data, those sorts of things. Um, and if all of this is a bit un unachievable in a final year project student uh, project, then perhaps thinking about working collaboratively so that we can really start to pull resources and boost our uh, um, kind of resources to be able to replicate findings in a way that actually is a fair replication test because we're actually doing it with enough statistical power to make some valid conclusions. Um, okay, so how do we square the circle then for research-led teaching where we need larger samples, pre-registration, preparing data for publication, all of this takes extra time and resources. But as I've already said, student projects are time limited, often poorly resourced, and we have this assessment criteria that has historically focused on individual contributions and novelty. So that was a long introduction to get to the what I actually do. Um, but what we've developed is a sort of, uh, we've called it the consortium approach to undergraduate projects, but basically it's a team science effort. It, it, we work across institutions to improve the quality of research training and open research. And the idea is that we can improve the quality of the research output. So we, we very much, um, Justin talked about that, that continuum of um, pedagogy and then research and that kind of, you know, where do you fall on that? I'm very much at the research end where I think we're, we're training our undergraduates as almost as apprentices on really high quality research projects and not really kind of thinking about it as just this individual voyage of discovery that they can then make all the errors they want along the way. We take more of a kind of apprenticeship model with, with that. And the idea is that they will contribute actively to really high quality research and therefore learn really high quality research methods along the way. So we should get some really good outputs from the current consortium, but hopefully they're also going to go on and become, you know, scientists of the future with these, these core skills embedded within their training. 
So by collaborating, we can increase power. Uh, we can increase generalizability to a point. I mean, we are working in different institutions, but we do mostly get student samples, to be fair. Um, and then there's transparency as well, because you have to be very transparent in your methods because you're collaborating across institutions. So very good standard operating procedures and protocols and things like that. Pre-registration, open data, open resources. And all of this is designed to allow individual assessment whilst promoting replication through a replication and extension model, which we've already heard about from the previous. Um, it's just a different, I've well, just called it a slightly different thing, but it's a similar model to the other two speakers have mentioned. Um, so in 2016, I presented this model to the British Psychology Society's Undergraduate Ed Education Committee, um, and they really liked it. So they, when they did their updated accreditation guidance, they changed their guidance to explicitly endorse group-based projects, which is a real step forward. So we can now all start doing the much more efficient and I think much more valuable team science approaches to our dissertations. But you'll notice that they'll still say that, you know, individual students are still required to demonstrate the above skills. So that's all the skills needed for a research project individually. So there's still a slight um, tension there. So we kind of try and square that circle, kind of deal with that tension in, in the following where we have one large overarching project which has a primary aim and the pre-registered hypothesis. So that would be kind of the overarching study aim. So if it's to replicate a previous finding or we don't always do replications, we've done a mixture, we've done a couple of replications so far and we've also done some uh, testing novel, novel ideas um, as well. But we have a primary pre-registered hypothesis which everybody kind of contributes to or writes up. And then each student goes away and they think about what they could add as an additional question or a secondary hypothesis to that project. So just as Justin was saying, you know, we might do moderator analyses, they might look at kind of um, uh, manipulation checks, that kind of thing. You know, there's always lots of scope within these larger projects for, to carve out individual secondary project ideas. Um, but the idea is that um, the publication focuses very much on the pre-registered primary aim and then the individualized dissertations can then focus on writing up around their specific secondary hypothesis. So that's how we get the individual um, kind of differences between every student's dissertation whilst retaining the integrity of the final research output that makes it into the public sphere. So we tend to have anywhere between three and four universities at a time, uh, a primary supervisor in each, um, we have a number of different students, usually the consortium is around 20, 20 people each year. Um, and then there's usually a number of students at each and depending on the structure of the collaborators and kind of research groups, we might have a number of postdocs or um, PhD students also helping out. Um, but each year the project is led by an early career researcher. So sometimes that's a PhD student, sometimes that's one of the postdocs. But that idea is that they take ownership and then become the lead author on any write up and they can manage the project closure and all those sorts of things because the students leave and then you're sort of left with this very big project that needs closing down and, and while you're building up the next one. So it's really good to have identified a role as the kind of principal investigator on the, on the research side almost. And then obviously us as academic supervisors take the lead on, on the academic supervision of our individual students. So we have a slight separation of responsibilities um, there between the kind of overall management of the research project and then the, um, the supervision of the students. Next slide. So in 2020, we published this idea in psychology, learning and teaching. And this was the kind of pre-COVID structure that we used to follow. Um, we, we still follow relatively, but it's, it's been adapted a bit since, since we've now um, all had to go online. Uh, but the idea is that it's quite a prescriptive model. So we, we do quite a lot of scaffolding. So the supervisors and the kind of broader research team uh, think about what research question um, we're going to answer. So if, if there's a particular paper that we think we're going to replicate that year, or whether we're going to ask a new research question following on from what we've already done, we basically decide what the overarching research question is going to be and develop what we call a bare bones protocol. Um, and that's decided between the supervisors and the PhD students and the postdocs. Then when we get allocated our students, we give those materials to the students over the summer and we say, go away and have a read around this topic area. Um, have a think about what additional questions you would like to add into the study protocol. You know, is there a hypothesis you want to add? What would be the materials you'd need to, to kind of add in? And how would you go about analysing your secondary question? 
Um, so they, they're tasked with going away and sort of designing, doing the research design and individual contribution part of a kind of secondary, a secondary research question. We then used to meet in around October and, and we'd have this big meeting where we did present the overall kind of ideas and then each student would have a, a kind of five minute slot to pitch their idea to the team. And then collaboratively, we would work through the pros and cons of each one and kind of finalize the shape of the protocol. Um, then be registered, we write it up and it'd be registered, pre-registered on the open science framework, collect data, write their dissertations up and so on. Um, and then we'd have a second consortium meeting to go through um, all of the results. Um, the students would then write up their dissertations and then the lead kind of early career researcher who is the PI of the research project would then take over kind of finalizing the manuscript preparation and making the, any materials um, openly available on the open science framework. Then COVID happened, so everything went online. And actually one of the benefits has been that we, we don't have those two big meetings in, the, in person in October and March. We now just meet every single week as a big consortium on Teams. So in a way that's meant that the students are getting even better access to this kind of wider group of academics and, um, and PhD students and postdocs. And I feel like it gives them a really nice exposure to feeling like that. I think Jim mentioned, you know, being part of a really big research group. Um, and hopefully that's a bit more um, of a kind of real world experience of how team research and, and collaborative research is conducted. So we take this replication and extension model, which we've used in two out of, and we've done about six or, six or so years of this now, um, but two of those years have been replications and extensions. So we take a, a kind of paper that we are interested in replicating one of the effects from it. So this was the original paper that it was looking at the role of training response inhibition to food and whether that's associated with weight loss and reduced energy intake. Um, and within that, one of their outcomes was looking at reduced wanting and liking of unhealthy foods. So our primary research question for this was the replication of, of, of that. And if you think about that direct um, uh, conceptual kind of continuum that Jim was talking, oh no, J Justin was talking about, it's kind of closest, closer to the direct, but it was actually more in a, the sample wasn't quite the same because it was more of a student um, sample and, and kind of friends and family sample, I suppose, which is what you end up a little bit sometimes with um, students recruiting people that they know. Um, it wasn't just people they knew, but it, but you do end up with, with kind of that. Um, and then the extension part was this moderator question. So, you know, one student asked in their dissertation, and is this effect moderated by impulsivity such that the more impulsive a person is, the more effective the training will be. And I think their rationale was that, you know, if it's in, you're working on inhibitory control, if somebody has problems with inhibitory control, perhaps the training will be more effective in, in, in them. And we had a whole range of secondary kind of questions and each student had um, a slightly different dissertation to write up. So we take the um, uh, sample size, the sample size calculation is based on the original published to be replicated treatment effect. So we took that from the Lawrence paper and to just replicate that published treatment effect would have required a sample of 106. Um, each student contributed their own moderator analysis um, and moderate testing for interactions essentially is notoriously underpowered. So we quadrupled our sample size to account for the testing of uh, moderator hypotheses, which gave us a very ambitious, this is the first year we ever ran this, so I've learned a lot. <laughs> it gave us a very ambitious 412. Um, and this was a study where they had a baseline session, did the training for a week and then a follow up a, a week. So it's actually a kind of longitudinal treatment study as well. So um, that was also, you know, you get attrition with that. So, so we, we don't tend to do longitudinal studies so much anymore. We, we tend to do a one, a one session, one the type design now because it's slightly easier. But we did, we reached an impressive sample size of 238. So absolutely loads of power to do the main kind of replication question. So, you know, big tick there, completely publishable on that front. Um, but then slightly underpowered to be able to test their moderator hypotheses, but, you know, still a really good sample to have a good go at it. So, um, so they did really well there. Um, we actually, for this study, carried on recruitment and then the paper was published just recently um, in Appetite. So that's the paper if anyone's interested. Um, so the other thing we're really keen on is doing all those other open science practices as well. So we pre-register absolutely everything and you can see all of the uh, pre-registrations that we've done over the years on the open science framework if you're interested. 
Um, each of the students can contribute their own hypotheses to this. So it's nice because they've got a DOI and they can add it to their CV already as a research output showing that they're engaged in open research practices. So that's quite a nice um, kind of thing as well. And where, where we can, um, we make, like if we, if we program new materials or resources and they've been done in open software or open access, we, we, we publish those on the Open Science Framework as well. So that doesn't happen for every study. It depends on the nature of the study, but, but where the, we try and, you know, we're working towards that as well. So some, some of our consortium projects have got all of their um, resources on, on the Open Science Framework as well. Okay, so what do the students think? Um, well, they really loved having the support from peers um, and they like the fact there's more people to help collect the data and the fact that projects can feel quite ambitious. Um, they like the shared responsibilities, uh, pre-registration transparency, the opportunity to meet other students. And I think they enjoyed the fact that they got to work with um, supervisors from different universities as well. So they got to see academics having those discussions and, and it shows we don't always agree on everything. And that actually, actually actually amongst academics, you know, there is a discussion that goes on in the design of a study while you're thrashing out how you're going to agree on the final sort of everything. So I think that gives them some really good real world insights into, into re research. But there are some disadvantages that they've noticed, um, differences in deadlines. They found that quite stressful. You know, the, the students with the first deadline were much more kind of stressed and anxious about getting their data collection done, whereas those with a slightly later deadline perhaps were a bit, uh, bit more relaxed. Um, you know, people relied on me, a bit of pressure. Well, that's actually just really good soft skills, right? <laughs> so although they've seen it as a disadvantage, in a way that's actually something quite cool in terms of their soft skill development. Um, I think sometimes they found it a bit confusing when researchers had different ideas. So exposing them to that kind of messiness of science and the fact that people don't always agree, um, but actually can be kind of a little bit disconcerting when they're used to just thinking that their supervisor knows all the answers and now their supervisor is being challenged by academic X uh, because they've got a rather different view on, on how to do that whatever calculation. Um, and then uh, joining a complex study instead of building it um, up from the ground and having slightly less say in the design. I think that's the major limitation for me is that uh, thinking back to that pedagogy sort of research kind of continuum, I do think, although they have the opportunity to add in these extra secondary questions, um, that coming in with no idea and having to work an idea completely up from the very beginning all the way through um, is something that I think they do miss out on. But then what they gain is they actually get to participate in some really high quality research, whereas quite often those studies where students do it all from the very beginning, in my experience, have ended up with really poor research outputs where they just spend their dissertation like writing up the limitations of why they can't really conclude anything because it's um, a bit naff, you know. Um, so it is a trade off. And I don't think given the timeline, there's really any way of completely allowing them to have both unless we make the dissertation a two year process where they spend the first year designing it and the second year running it. Um, but in the time scale, I don't think you can do everything to the highest level that you would want to. So to conclude then, um, the excessive focus on novelty and creativity is at odds with cumulative science. It just is. So we really need to promote a culture of replication. And this is seen, you know, as we've all heard, and increasingly seen as vital for improving the reliability and credibility of science. Uh, the empirical dissertation has traditionally focused on novelty and individual assessment, um, but consortium studies using a replication and extension model offer one way, and we've heard about what well, there's lots of other ways of doing this, to deliver high quality replications whilst maintaining individual assessment. Students pool their resources to achieve adequate sample sizes, they adopt open research practices, and they learn from replicating the work of others whilst introducing their own ideas through secondary hypotheses. Um, so I'd just like to thank all my wonderful collaborators <laughs> um, and I think we're going to open up for questions now. Um, so if you have any questions, do, do ask. Yeah, awesome. And thank you. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. That was really, really fascinating. Um, I thought maybe the best thing to do would just be to wait a minute and give people a chance maybe to put questions in the Q&A so I don't... Um, uh, take the wheel too much, but I, but I certainly have questions um, if we just want to maybe wait a few seconds first.
So yeah, I, oh yeah, I see one popping up. Um, okay, so this is from uh, Judith, um, Judith Kobe. So if multiple students add moderators to a design, how does that affect the manageability of data collection? So I guess that would kind of apply to, I mean, I think that was gonna be one of the things I was gonna comment on is I think a lot of you, I think in some ways are talking about adding moderators and adding adding add-ons per student kind of thing. So yeah, how does that affect the man manageability of data collection? I guess that can mean a few things like in terms of power considerations, maybe also in terms of the length of the study or possibly as well in terms of like, if you're looking for certain individual differences, do you have to go to certain populations to fairly uh, get enough variability in that kind of measure? Um, so maybe I'll just open that up to everybody. Thoughts? Okay, well, maybe I'll um, come in first on that. So um, we we kind of, sometimes students come up with very similar ideas, in which case we would then whittle it down to choose the best measure that is the most reliable and that we all agree might be the best way of measuring that. Um, it's one of the benefits of working across universities. So in each institution, they, their dissertations need to be a bit different, but actually across institutions, you could have two students writing something on the same moderator, say at Cardiff and, and Bath, because they're not gonna be working super closely with students in the actual write-up process at other universities. So that, I, so that problem, potential problem of ending up with very, very similar, you know, two incredibly similar dis dissertations that then gets co-marked by somebody who's not a fan of replication and feels like it's all a bit, you know, it is, is, isn't so much of a problem. Um, we do think quite carefully about the kind of participant burden. So when you're building up the um, kind of the research procedure, um, you know, making sure that all of the measures that we add in uh, are kind of, uh, kind of feasible within a given time scale. But actually, you know, in an hour's testing session, you can quite often get quite a lot done and, and lots of these individual difference measures are actually very quick to complete. So you can have quite an extensive battery of, uh, of kind of individual difference questionnaires at the end that actually really only adds 10 minutes onto an experiment. Um, so that seems to um, kind of uh, work quite well. It's more tricky when a student has a secondary question that would mean adding something quite substantial into the design or something that might actually change the integrity of the primary research question. So by adding say a baseline measure that might do some sort of priming effect or, or something that actually could end up changing very much how they respond on other aspects. So we do have to think quite um, kind of carefully about those sorts of things, but, but generally it hasn't, hasn't been too much of a problem. The statistical power is, is an issue. Um, so that's why I, I like to think about the primary question as being the kind of the thing we're really going to focus on in the publication and then the secondary questions are really to allow the students to have that scope to be able to do something slightly different but I do think of those as being slightly more towards that pedagogical end of that continuum we've talked about you know I want the primary publishable part to be very much absolutely at the end of the research kind of side of that but actually I'm happy for it to move a little bit down the pedagogy um, towards the pedagogy end for the secondary questions because it is essentially um, allowing the students to do their own write-up. Okay brilliant. Um, uh, I had a question I, I think that would probably apply to, to all of you uh, about equally. Um, I, so I think a few of you in particular Justin mentioned kind of student anxieties when it comes to uh, the dissertation process and certainly I can see the argument that to a certain extent um, replicating something might uh, help address some of those concerns. Have you experienced any concerns from students uh, in terms of anxieties and worries about the open side of all of this? So pre-registering can be scary, right? Um, open data can be scary in some ways to students. Um, have you found any of that or do they, do they tend to take to it quite warmly, would you say? Uh, I know um, uh, uh, Catherine, you already mentioned that briefly, but I'm yeah, looking for other thoughts too. That was interesting. Oh, I think you can just, yeah, turn your mic on. Jump, yeah. Just jump. <laughs> so I'll just jump in here, yeah. Um, so, yes, yeah, so, so pre-registration is, is an important thing. I, think, uh, I don't think I had hit it. So one of the things I do with the students is I also have them all do a pre-registration, but I don't have them posted on the OSF. So I have them fill out the pre-registration, write it, and give it to me. And we go through it, and we save it. And then I say, well, this isn't, this isn't a summative assessment. This is something we're working, so you can recycle all that 
for your summative assessment when you write. So it's more of like pre-writing your dissertation and, and getting it. So so the open side is uh, it's not. So I don't I don't have them put that in the on the open side. So I haven't had them have that um, anxiety. No. I, I do something similar to to Justin in that sense, unless unless it is something that I think okay, this 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 could be a goer, and I I see a clear publication with this, in which case it will. And the funny thing is, I, I find the students that I have done that with, where we've posted things publicly online, they they tend to be more hesitant sharing their work with with their fellow students, you know, just just sharing their introduction or something with a colleague, but don't seem to mind when it when it goes on on the OSF. Um, so my experience is they've been absolutely fine with it. Yeah, and I, my model's a bit different because it's quite <clears throat> ambitious. So we have, and that's very much the role of the kind of research PI part in that design, um, because it is actually a lot of work to create, uh, you know, you can use as predicted. And sometimes I've done that where they just put their hypothesis up and, and it's just a line and a couple of lines about their design, that's fine. But doing a really high quality pre-registration for the open science framework is like maybe three months work, <laughs> which, you know, is a lot for an individual student. And I've also, had the problem where I've done pre-registrations with students and I've allowed them to kind of take a lead on writing them and put them up and actually um you know I had I had one I've got one pre-registration on the open science framework that still has my last round of comments in because I replied to the students and said either do ANOVA or do mixed effects regression um once you've made these changes I'm happy for it to be uploaded and they just uploaded it without because you know I was treating them like PhD students or something they just uploaded it without doing any of the amendments so it's there now forever for everyone to look at and after that I was like mm, actually I I think we, you, it's nice to take a bit of control about that stuff that's going into the public domain because we don't want to be adding lots of messy you know error prone stuff out there um so we pre-register everything but that's because the um our PI takes a lead on that so the early career researcher who's leading the project drafts it and takes very much control and the students are just collaborators and co-authors within that and have a little section where they add their own stuff in so it, we are micromanaging a bit but because of the reasons the other two have alluded to you know you, you don't want to be publishing lots of open and the same with data right you don't want to be putting uncurated data sets out there that are basically noise um, so it, unless you've got the time to do the checks and do it properly um, doing it more internally is, um, I think, a very good idea. Okay, awesome. Um, I'm just looking, I don't think there's anything else in the FAQ yet. Um, I do have other questions, but again, I don't want to take up too much of the time. Tweevy, do you have anything you wanted to ask? Or just in your yeah, way? I, I, yeah, I could bring up that. So, so one of the things that uh, Kate was bringing up about the having the dissertations being different questions. So this is one of the things that we've also been struggling with this. And I've been taking kind of a quite different view uh, uh, of people where I uh, I would think that the students can't have the same question. So I, I've actually done, done one, one project where we did a, a, rep, a replication of a previous data set, which, which was and it involved just getting another data. It's sec it was a secondary analysis during COVID of, of uh, incoming student uh, high school qualifications and their final degree classifications and, and looking at their, their, how well incoming qualifications predict student performance, because there's a, a bit of literature on that. And there was an, an interesting study that I said, OK, here's some study. We can get some data, anonymized data from the university. It's COVID. We, don't, <laughs> we can ask some interesting questions. We can do secondary analysis. And I had a group of four or five students with the same paper, the same data set, and they all got to very different project results. Basically the same question. And I think the five students, they spanned from a two, two to a high first in, in sort of what they ended up. And the things I read were just so completely different from student to student that, that I think um, trying to make everything different. I don't know if we need to do that as much, especially as we get more and more and more students. <laughs> that was one of the things that gets me. I, I started with like two supervised students. Oh, that's easy to get two different things. Or I started to get you know six or more than six, just trying to keep what the students are doing. The, the, the amount of moving parts in different directions is starting to, to, to do my head in. I don't know, 12, 12 C <laughs> above my capacity. So I do have a question uh, more on the, oh, I think someone just asked a question, but uh, um, yeah, my question is more on the organizational uh, side. 
something. So it sounds like each of you has different approach of how you're gonna have the student. Um, like it's so far, I think I resonate a lot with what Justin shared about the student anxiety. And also I came from the US system as well. So coming to the UK, it was just in the US, only a few students would sign up to be thesis on a thesis, do on a thesis project. Whereas here, everyone has to almost like do their own project. So because of that, then yeah, depending on institution, each of us might take on from five to 12 students. Um, so can you share a little bit about in terms of the organizations at the beginning of the project? Do you have to, for example, um, I learned about um, CREPS is the model in the US where they have the, their own organization team that would give, like would vote and decide on one study that semester where supervisor can sign up to replicate um, the project that the CREPS is C, I think, yeah, CRE, uh, yeah. So the, the, the team decide the project and then you sign up to replicate. And because of that, there's a lot of the infrastructures and organization is the team already does. And this is you take less work than the supervisor, it's from the supervisor. Um, whereas from what you guys have shared, it sounds like the supervisor still do most of the heavy lifting at the very beginning and then organize and get the student to then collect data. Is that correct? Or like how, how's your experience on that front? Okay, so oh. go for it, Jim. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I was going to say, I mean, for, for me, what we do is at, at, towards the end of the second year, all supervisors um, publish research questions that they're interested in students, um, and then students select which ones they find most interesting and then are allocated on a, on a basis of, well, it's not first come, first serve, but it's, it, we try to find people who get their first choice if possible. Um, so what I do in that process is I keep my questions pretty broad um, and then when I've got my students I've already got an idea of the types of questions they're interested in and then I use that to uh, allocate them into subgroups so I'll have uh, as in my presentation I'll have three subgroups of four who've all expressed a particular interest in a particular approach um, then what I'll do is I'll meet with with that group uh, each group of four students every week just to talk about the general overall question, but then I will follow up with one-to-one -one meetings with them the week after, for example, and then alternate between group meetings, individual meetings, until it feels that each student has identified something that they can contribute to the overall research question. And then from really late semester one and then all the way through semester two, it's purely just group, group supervision. Yeah, so I, I only do group supervision and in fact I work and um, so I have about four students a year on the undergraduate consortium, but I also have about six students from the applied MSc and applied clinical psychology. So in total I have about 10 students. Um, so I do the, the kind of cross university consortium for the undergraduate part, but I do a team science approach within my university for the MSc student project usually. So I usually work with another colleague um, where we have complementary um, interests and we have both our students or combine our students because I'm really big on sample size. <laughs> um, I, do, I don't like having other pad studies. Um, and also I, we have, I have a lot of PhD students and I, and I really like it as a training opportunity for them as well. So usually I, I kind of say to my PhD students, come up with an idea or a search project topic that you'd be really interested in. So then we advertise that project and then the students, MSc students join, for example. Um, and then the first few weeks we meet as a group and each student's encouraged to go away and think about their secondary question. So they all add something unique into the, the project, but everyone's collect, you know, everyone's got their own research ideas, but we have this one big kind of collaborative team project. So all of my supervision is in teams. We all meet every week, once a week as a big team on this research project. And, and the supervision is, is done in that way. I enjoy it much more. I really like working as part of a team. Um, I like working with my kind of other colleagues. And, and so I don't know if the students miss individual kind of supervision, but um, 
I haven't really asked them, perhaps I should, but maybe I don't want to know what the answer is. <laughs> um, but in terms of organisation, that's essentially like we come up with the idea, the broad idea, basically before the students have even started and we advertise that project. Um, so we have an idea of where we want to go for our wider research group interests. Um, and then the students always add something new. Um, but we have these very structured, you know, we meet every week and then we'll go through the ethics, you know, one week and we go through hypotheses and another week and then when we get later on we'll have sessions on the data analysis and so on um but it's and then the overall kind of project kind of is managed on a day-to-day -day basis by the phd student so if the students have particular issues with setting up the kind of research materials or whatever then they can they can work very closely with the phd student on that front um and i like that idea of the just knowledgeable other so you kind of you know this idea of if you're being working with somebody who's just a few steps ahead of you then actually that's when you can often get the most um kind of learning benefits because they'll have just gone through it so it's fresh in their mind and they're able to impart that knowledge and so it helps them instill it in their own because they're having to teach somebody what they've just learned um, and then the kind of the the undergraduates or msc students are learning from somebody who's just a little bit ahead of them and and, and not people like me who maybe hasn't done actually anything technical for a while <laughs> um, so yeah, that's how we do it. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, uh, for way for whether or not it's a, a, the more work is 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 an interesting question, but because I don't necessarily find it more work than what Kate was saying before about you know starting something from scratch. I tend to find those ones a lot more work and a lot more difficult to supervise because a lot of times the students are coming with something that they're interested in is or kind of outside of my area of expertise so it's a lot of work for me to try and wrap my head around what they're trying to do instead of something oh i know this i can tell you you need to do x y and z <laughs> don't do q because then it won't work you know that's that's i like i i like it when it's closer but then you'd also mentioned crap because i think that's something we might uh, to talk about which is very similar to what you have uh structured kate but a, a little bit different in the, over in the u.s and um i i think it also might be useful at some point to talk about ways we can sort of make these bigger because this is something that i'd like to be more involved with because one of the things prep does is they sort of pre-select a series of studies not just one they'll do like they, i think they have eight or ten together and they they are kind of it's not quite the the consortium so that's not as nice so that's really nice how you have this whole consortium where everybody's working together uh, on, on different parts the crep one which is what let me see i keep using that acronym and nobody ever remembers acronyms is collaborative replication and education project um, so they, they have a sort of a steering committee group advisors where they come through and look like five years in previously and look at papers and select a set of papers that they think are feasible for undergraduates to replicate and interesting. And they, cut, and they put those as a set of groups and then they set these up as a replication target. And any group can add in a replication to it. So you don't have to be part of the consortium. You can say, oh, you're replicating this paper. This is an interesting paper. I want to do a replication of that paper. So and they say, well, here we have on the open science framework, the set of materials to do a set of instructions. You understand it. You go, you have to, and you give them your proposal to do the replication that you pre-register, you know, how, what's your power, what, how many are you going to do, and what little are you going to have to do your little changes and then you can do your replication sort of independently of that project so so you you don't have to be plugged into the certain deadlines or certain things where other things are going you know, you can do things a, a, asynchronously so i think that's also an interesting model to try and grow things into um, um more accessible ways to get the, the replication going and the nice thing about the crap there is they can have all the materials so if, if, if it was for a direct replication for say something an online study they'll have the stuff ready that you can just sort of fork and, and get going which is nice i did want to hit so judith had a question about collusion and plagiarism so i, I just wanted to to hit that a little bit i would say i have no more problems with that than i do have for any student essay i give with when i give them the same question so it's it's there, it, it does happen. And plagiarism is usually not, I find, I usually haven't found them between students. I've, had, I've seen that happen once, but almost always, the vast majority of plagiarisms we catch are students plagiarizing from external sources, taking from papers, taking from websites. I had one student have something in there that even had open bracket citation needed, still in the, 
and the whole Wikipedia format <laughs> right there. So I'll just come in on, on, on plagiarism and um, because uh, we had, we were setting up a new, um, uh, a new module in our MSc Applied Clinical Psychology where I wanted to create a module that was like the research apprenticeship where they would basically write their pre-registration for their dissertation. And so the students were writing these really beautiful, long introductions and the rationale for their study, you know, a bit like a registered report where you've basically written the first half of your paper and then they put it on the open science framework. And then actually when they want to use that for their dissertation, it was coming back as <laughs> plagiarizing themselves, <laughs> which actually felt very unfortunate. So now what I encourage my students to do is to, um, I mean, it doesn't matter so much for the consortium because that's written by um, the kind of PhD student. And actually watch out, what I have to watch out for there is that sometimes their methods results are a bit kind of consistent amongst each other because there's this incredibly good example that they can follow. Um, but, you know, um, we focus a bit more on the introduction and the, um, and the discussion they write. And that's why it's quite good that each one has a separate you know, they all do the primary thing, but that secondary question is a main focus of their introduction and rationale, which means that that kind of helps separate them out. So that's why I quite like to have them doing slightly different research questions for that secondary part. Um, but what I've now encouraged my students to do for the um, uh, for the kind of MSc Applied Clinical Psychology is I've created a pre-registration form where I've made them, rather than doing a really kind of traditional introduction and background, I kind of set it out as they have a very short box for their research rationale, and then they have another one for research and context. So they have to do more of that kind of Lancet thing where you basically say, you know, this is what's been found um, in, in the literature so far, this is where the gaps are, and this is what I'm adding. So just trying to structure the introduction in a different way. So it doesn't mean that they write lots of beautiful words that they then can't use later. So I did feel very sorry for them when, you know, we had these um, really long, wonderful backgrounds and introductions and, um, um, and, and then they can't use it in their dissertation because uh, I tell plagiarism. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think we're pretty much at time here, right? Do we, do we tend to, we're trying to finish by 2, 2.30, does that sound right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, we haven't touched on, even on the statistical analysis yet, but I think, because <laughs> I think that's very widely across institutions in the UK, because I, yeah, because for me, because it sounds like I, I don't do replication, but I do group student into a group and they do share a paradigm of procedures and they add in their own variables and uh, measures. Um, so it all went fine up until the analysis part because then I realized that like I think with the training they usually take that year one, year two, but we know that statistical uh, skills you kind of just have to keep doing it. Um, otherwise if you go through six months and then they come back and I'm like, oh, do this. And they kind of forget what they learn, where to click to find certain, make certain tables and stuff like that. So yeah, unfortunately we haven't covered that today, but yeah. But thank you a lot for all this discussion. Oh, we do have one question. So I'm just gonna leave time for that. Yeah. Yeah, sounds good. Um, so yeah, the final question, we'll just maybe just try to keep it brief uh, and we'll try to wrap up in, in just a few minutes here. But um, this is from, uh, from Maya. Um, I struggled many times with students' anxiety about not finding anything significant and then feeling like they kind of failed, you know, I guess is in the context of like original research. Um, so I found the pre-registration very helpful in getting students excited. So, you know, before I was suggest it was hinting, you know, is it possible they get nervous about pre-registration, but she's kind of raising the other side of this. Does this sometimes get students quite a lot more excited about what they're doing? Um, yeah, um, she's wondering whether you've had similar experiences. <laughs> so just briefly, um, we published quite a few of our, most years we managed to publish our consortium project and actually lots of them have been null <laughs> um, because when you do pre-register, even with very large sample sizes, sometimes you're, and I think that's the wonderful thing about pre-registration and doing really well powered designs is that even if your results are null, it's still a really good contribution to the field. So it just takes that anxiety away. You know, you're gonna get a publication because you've done a high quality piece of research. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I, I think, I, I, I recognize this experience all of the time. I also recognize that when students put in their the hypotheses that we hope to find X, Y, or Z, I'm like, well, you know, you, 
you can't really hope to find something something either is or it isn't you've just got to design your study well enough so that if it does exist you can you can find it um, and if your, your study is well powered as Kate says that if you don't find something that's a valuable contribution um, and it's it's a journey taking students and colleagues on um, but yeah definitely recognize that comment all right, brilliant. I see uh, uh, Justin made a comment as well in the in the chat. Um, so I think uh, should we try to should we should we bring this to a close then? Um, okay. Well, thank you uh, everybody both for your questions and of course to the speakers for their wonderful presentations and and fantastic discussion we had here. Um, yeah, thank you all very much for your time. It was wonderful to meet you all again. Brilliant. Thank you very much. It was really enjoyable. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.